fourth part of chapter nine of the first volume of the life of reason this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by fredrik karlsson the life of reason by george santayana side note its untoward significance to say that this conflict is the guide to its own issue is to talk without thinking the conflict is the sign of inadequate organization or of non-adaptation in the given organism to the various stimuli which irritate it the reconstruction which follows this conflict when it indeed follows is of course a new and better adaptation so that what involves the pain may often be a process of training which directs reaction into new and smoother channels but the pain is present whether a permanent adaptation is being attained or not it is present in progressive dissolution and in hopeless and exhausting struggles far more than in education or in profitable correction toothache and seasickness birth pangs and melancholia are not useful ills the intenser the pain the more probable its uselessness only in vanishing is it a sign of progress in occurring it is an omen of defeat just as disease is an omen of death although for those diseased already medicine and convalescence may be approaches to health again where a man's nature is out of gear and his instincts are inordinate suffering may be a sign that a dangerous peace in which impulse was carrying him ignorantly into paths without issue is giving place to a peace with security in which his reconstructed character may respond without friction to the world and enable him to gather a clearer experience and enjoy a purer vitality the utility of pain is thus apparent only and due to empirical haste in collating events that have no regular nor inward relation and even this imputed utility pain has only in proportion to the worthlessness of those who need it sidenote perfect function no unconscious a second current prejudice which may deserve notice suggests that an organ when its function is perfect becomes unconscious so that if adaptation were complete life would disappear the well-learned routine of any mechanical art passes into habit and habit into unconscious operation the virtuoso is not aware how he manipulates his instrument what was conscious labor in the beginning has become instinct and miracle in the end thus it might appear that to eliminate friction and difficulty would be to eliminate consciousness and therefore value from the world life would thus be involved in a contradiction and moral effort in an absurdity for while the constant aim of practice is perfection and that of labor ease and both are without meaning or standard unless directed to the attainment of these ends yet such attainment if it were actual would be worthless so that what alone justifies effort would lack justification and would in fact be incapable of existence the good musician must strive to play perfectly but alas we are told if he succeeded he would have become an automaton the good man must aspire to holiness but alas if he reached holiness his moral life would have evaporated these melodramatic prophecies however need not alarm us they are founded on nothing but rhetoric and small allegiance to any genuine good when we attain perfection of function we lose consciousness of the medium to become more clearly conscious of the result the eye that does its duty gives no report of itself and has no sense of muscular tension of weariness but it gives all the brighter and steadier image of the object seen consciousness is not lost when focused and the labor of vision is abolished in its fruition so the musician 
could he play so divinely as to be unconscious of his body his instrument and the very lapse of time would be only the more absorbed in the harmony more completely master of its unities and beauty at such moments the body's long labor at last brings forth the soul life from its inception is simply some partial natural harmony raising its voice and bearing witness to its own existence to perfect that harmony is to round out and intensify that life this is the very secret of power of joy of intelligence not to have understood it is to have passed through life without understanding anything the analogy extends to morals where also the means may be advantageously forgotten when the end has been secured that leisure to which work is directed and that perfection in which virtue would be fulfilled are so far from being apathetic that they are states of pure activity by containing which other acts are rescued from utter passivity and unconsciousness impure feeling ranges between two extremes absolute want and complete satisfaction the former limit is reached in anguish madness or the agony of death when the accidental flux of things in contradiction has reached its maximum or vanishing point so that the contradiction and the flux themselves disappear by deremption such feeling denotes inward disorganization and a hopeless conflict of reflex actions tending toward dissolution the second limit is reached in contemplation when anything is loved understood or enjoyed synthetic power is then at its height the mind can survey its experience and correlate all the motion it suggests power in the mind is exactly proportionate to representative scope and representative scope to rational activity a steady vision of all things in their true order and worth results from perfection of function and is its index it secures the greatest distinctness in thought together with the greatest decision wisdom and ease in action as the lightning is brilliant and quick it also secures so far as human energies avail its own perpetuity since what is perfectly adjusted within and without lasts long and goes far side note inquate ethics to confuse means with ends and mistake disorder for vitality is not unnatural to minds that hear the hum of mighty workings but can imagine neither the cause nor the fruits of that portentous commotion all functions in such chaotic lives seem instrumental functions it is then supposed that what serves no further purpose can have no value and that he who suffers no obfuscation can have no feeling and no life to attain an ideal seems to destroy its worth moral life at that low level is a fantastic game only not having come in sight of humane and liberal interests the barbarian's intensity is without seriousness and his passion without joy his philosophy which means to glorify all experience and to digest all vice is in truth an expression of pathetic innocence it betrays a rudimentary impulse to follow every beckoning hand to assume that no adventure and no bewitchment can be anything but glorious such an attitude is intelligible in one who has never seen anything worth seeing nor loved anything worth loving immaturity could go no farther than to acknowledge no limits defining will and happiness when such limits however are gradually discovered and an authoritative ideal is born of the marriage of human nature with experience happiness becomes at once definite and attainable for adjustment is possible to a world that has a fruitful and intelligible structure such incoherences which might well arise in ages without traditions may be preserved and fostered by superstition 
perpetual servile employments and subjection to an irrational society may render people incapable even of conceiving a liberal life. They may come to think their happiness no longer separable from their misery and to fear the large emptiness, as they deem it, of a happy world. Like the prisoner of Chillon, after so long a captivity, they would regain their freedom with a sigh. The wholesome influences of nature, however, would soon revive their wills, contorted by unnatural oppression, and a vision of perfection would arise within them upon breathing a purer air. Freedom and perfection are synonymous with life. The peace they bring is one whose names are also rapture, power, clear sight, and love, for these are parts of peace. Side note. Thought the entelechy of being. Thought belongs to the sphere of ultimate results. What, indeed, could be more fitting than that consciousness, which is self-revealing and transcendentally primary, should be its own excuse for being and should contain its own total value, together with the total value of everything else? What could be more proper than that the whole worth of ideas should be ideal? To make an idea instrumental would be to prostitute what, being self-existent, should be self-justifying. That continual absoluteness which consciousness possesses, since in it alone all heaven and earth are at any moment revealed, ought to convince any radical and heart-searching philosopher that all values should be continually integrated and realized there, where all energies are being momentally focused. Thought is a fulfillment. Its function is to lend utility to its causes and to make actual those conceived and subterranean processes which find in it their ultimate expression thought is nature represented it is potential energy producing life and becoming an actual appearance side note its exuberance the conditions of consciousness however are far from being its only theme as consciousness bears a transcendent relation to the dynamic world for it is actual and spiritual while the dynamic is potential and material, so it may be exuberant and irresponsibly rich. Although its elements, in point of distribution and derivation, are grounded in matter, as music is in vibrations, yet in point of character the result may be infinitely redundant. The complete musician would devote but a small part of his attention to the basis of music, its mechanism, psychology, or history. Long before he had represented to his mind the causes of his art, he would have proceeded to practice and enjoy it. So sense and imagination, passion and reason, may enrich the soil that breeds them and cover it with a maze of flowers. The theme of consciousness is accordingly far more than the material world which constitutes its basis, though this also is one of its themes. Thought is no less at home in various expressions and embroideries with which the material world can be overlaid in imagination. The material world is conceived by digging beneath experience to find its cause. It is the efficacious structure and skeleton of things. This is a subject of scientific retrospect and calculation. The forces disclosed by physical studies are of course not directed to producing a mind that might merely describe them. A force is expressed in many other ways than by being defined. It may be felt, resisted, embodied, transformed or symbolized. Forces work. They are not, like mathematical concepts, exhausted in description from that matter which might be describable in mechanical formulae there issue notwithstanding all manner of forms and harmonies visible audible imaginable and passionately prized 
Every phase of the ideal world emanates from the natural and loudly proclaims its origin by the interest it takes in natural existences, of which it gives a rational interpretation. Sense, art, religion, society express nature exuberantly, and in symbols long before science is added to represent, by a different abstraction, the mechanism which nature contains. End of chapter 9